Hey, Pastor Steve Waldron. I hope you're having a great day or night in Jesus. Please subscribe and share with your friends, family, church family, and give us a thumbs up. So we're going to be looking at uh, Christianity and sociology and a biblical worldview. This is under our worldview playlist, maybe some other playlists as well. They get put various places, but I think for sure it's under the worldview playlist, some of the interior. So we're looking at Immanuel Kant today. Manuel Kant of Konigsberg. Uh, I remember my philosophy professor telling me, you know, he would walk every day uh, at the same place at three o'clock. You know, he was just that kind of guy. But he was developing what came to be known as the categorical imperative, and it's how do you have morality without the Bible, basically. It's shocking to me when I've taught this sometimes at uh, college that uh, Christians in the class, or a lot of times it's homeschoolers, they'll say, oh, Kant was a Christian. Well, he was in some sense of that term, but <clears throat> um, his findings have been used for, let's say, non-Christian things. And so the categorical imperative is one thing. We're looking at sociology, groups, group dynamics, in-group, out-group behavior. I think you'll see where I'm going with this is because how do you know what's right and wrong in in-group, out-group behavior? Now, if you just read the Bible, it's going to tell you to love one another, love each other with a pure heart fervently. One of our first lessons on Christian sociology is going through scriptures, communion, foot washing, these type things. You even have like Genesis 11, 6 at Babel, nothing, you know, with unity, nothing's going to be uh, prevented from what the uh, people at Babel were doing, the tower they were building to heaven, this kind of thing. But And uh, love all men, Paul says, uh, do good to all men, especially those of the household of faith. Pray for your enemies, bless those that curse you, do good to those that spitefully use you, and on and on. Uh, Matthew 5, 43 and 44, Sermon on the Mount, absolutely amazing. It's the reason Thomas Jefferson, even though he didn't accept the miraculous parts of Scripture, he said the teaching that Jesus taught, the morality, was of the highest order, no doubt about that. But I believe in the miracles as well. I accept it all. I, I trust it and with evidence see it, many infallible priests. <clears throat> so... But not only categorical imperative, that it's it's almost a fool's errand to come up with, um, and Nietzsche saw this, with morality divorced from uh, some higher power, some authority. And that authority, as Nietzsche would say, you know, the worst form of authority is just man versus man. And because they're always going to be selfish, and Orwell saw this like an animal farm. I like Orwell's other writings too, like Retreat from, uh, what was it, Wigram Pier. I enjoyed that. I know he's a socialist, but I, I just, I've gotten a lot reading Orwell, not just 1984, which I read many times, Animal Farm, which I've read a few times. Um, I've liked everything I've ever read from Orwell. Reminds me a little bit of uh, Farewell to Arms, you know, uh, his name escapes me, the old man in the sea, who Hemingway, Ernest Hemingway. But I think they had maybe some similar experiences in the Spanish Civil War. Uh, didn't he write For Whom the Bell Tolls? That's what that was about. But anyhow, so Immanuel Kant not only has this categorical imperative, and I've done videos and I need to, this is not the video to do why you can't have morality uh, really without the Bible because it, it becomes a fool's errand. And even people like Dawkins and Hitchens maybe, some of these have seen that the biblical society gives you this base, a baseline of morality. And it's like, you know, you pull a table out from a set, you know, uh, dishes and you <laughs> Well, there's this moment where it's standing, it's still there, but eventually, because it doesn't have any supports, it, it drops to the ground. And again, um, we have dealt 
with with dozens if not hundreds of atheists here on the channel over the years we got several thousand videos here i know it's an extremely small channel but we have i've done some videos that really got under their skin and some of them almost went kind of viral some of them i've removed off the internet just because it was a fool's errand to keep it on the internet because it was you know one guy writing two or three sentences versus people who aren't even watching the video and i've got colleges and uh, the uk and stuff that i'm their subject matter in their classes and they just ridicule and all this it's a crazy deal and uh <clears throat> but just know i mean it's very difficult to have morality because people say well just do good to everybody well define good where do you get your definition of good because some people are going to define good in what is intrinsically felt because of we're creating the image of god and we have conscious very bad things and uh what if what if uh, hitler thought it was good to do this or what if stalin thought it was good to uh kill the ukrainians you know or something well this is obviously a terrible thing but not only that with the categorical imperative with Immanuel Kant of Konigsberg, but the nomia versus the phenomia and this brings in something the uh that paul johnson brings out in his modern times and i'm not sure if we'll get to that in this lesson and so the nomia is things as it really is the phenomia is that that we perceive it to be and so like i've got this little board i ordered from amazon boy it's come in handy lap desk you know i forget probably around 20 bucks somewhere in that neighborhood and it's just lasted me a long time got a little but so it appears to me the different colors wood grain feeling all of these things but since i'm finite what if my feelings are imperfect on this and what if somebody else sees it and has different variations on it? And this is the difference between the nomia, that which really is, the phenomia, that which I experience. Now, Wittgenstein, or as we should say, Wittgenstein, really fleshed this out into the 1920s, as did the Vienna Circle, that they went after language. That if I say the sky's blue, well, you could say what's well, azure, or it's this, it's that, and the other. Uh, maybe it's pale blue. There's different dimensionalities blue. When I say blue, I may think of, of dark blue. You may think of, of sky blue. You may think of oceanic blue. And there's just differences in blues. And so then nobody can know anything for sure. And this was really bought into, as Johnson brings out, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle of which Einstein's response to that God doesn't play dice but that's where that famous terminology and then the theory of relativity and it goes into Fletcher's situational ethics so we're going to stop there thanks for being here God bless talk with you later bye bye